Well, hello. If you've just joined us, we are coming to you live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Thanks for tuning in. Of course, you are watching The Week Ahead, where I'm Diesel Bolson. And of course, we'll be paying a tribute to the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, of course, uh, passed away again at the age of 90. That will be the focus of our coverage. It's just after one o'clock. Let's take a look at some of your top stories, perhaps, before we, we delve into the, the program for today. We've seen that global peace and anti-apartheid struggle cleric and icon Archbishop Emeritus uh, Desmond Tutu, in fact, has passed away in Cape Town at the age of 90. A renowned uh, advocate for human rights and, and obviously social justice at large, Tutu lived and preached uh, everything, the values of justice, forgiveness and equality. Let's take a look at his life in times. A lifelong human rights and social justice champion, Desmond and Pilo Tutu, lived and preached the values of justice, forgiveness and equality. I believe we have the capacity to be one of the most wonderful countries in the world. We could be a truly compassionate country where everyone was cared for, where no one went to bed hungry, where everyone mattered and knew they mattered, whether they were poor and uneducated, they would matter because they are created in the image of God. Tutu was born in Clarksdorp on the 7th of October 1931 to parents Zachariah Tutu and Alita Matlare. Baptized as Methodists, the family became Anglicans in 1943. At the age of 12, his family and other residents were removed to areas such as Kanana and Joburton under the Group Areas Act. He completed his senior certificate in 1950 and later enrolled at the Pretoria Bantu Normal College to study education. He continued his studies and completed a bachelor's degree from the University of South Africa in 1954. Tutu quit as a teacher in protest against the implementation of the Bantu Education Act. He left South Africa to further his theological studies in London in 1962 and obtained his Master's of Theology degree from King's College. Tutu became the first black Anglican Dean of Johannesburg. He was consecrated as Bishop on the 11th of July 1976 in the wake of the Soweto student uprising. In 1978, Tutu was appointed as the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. Under his leadership, the church in South Africa became immersed in the anti-apartheid political struggle. Tutu constantly told the apartheid government that its racist approach defied the will of God. We've had a good meeting, yes, and I'm not going to say a great deal more than that uh, it was a meeting. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 for his untiring efforts in working towards the end of white minority rule. The first black Anglican Bishop of Johannesburg and Cape Town, Tutu was appointed as the Chancellor of the University of the Western Cape in 1988. He chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission following the first democratic elections in 1994 and retired from the church in 1996. He was made Emeritus Archbishop of Cape Town, an unusual honorary title in the Anglican Church. When we forget the past, you are going to forget the price that was paid for the freedom that we enjoy today. You have to remember you have to remember so that you don't repeat. And it is so easy. Human beings have very short memories. Yesterday's oppressed easily become today's oppressors. In 1997, Tutu was diagnosed with prostate cancer. A decade later, he became a founding member and chairperson of the Elders, an independent group of global leaders working together for peace, justice and human rights. He officially retired from public life in October 2010. I will always stand up against injustice. Whoever is the perpetrator, they must know that as long as I have breath in my body, I will speak up against injustice.
Dubbing post-apartheid South Africa as the Rainbow Nation, Tutu has remained a vociferous international human rights activist and is widely regarded as South Africa's moral conscience. Vanessa Puna, SABC News, Cape Town. I'll continue as tributes continue to pour in for the late Archbishop uh, Emeritus Desmond Tutu. Silo Atangsi of Nelson Mandela Foundation joins us via hybrid to reflect on the life and times. Silo, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Perhaps as, as everything was just happening on such short notice and the world comes to terms with what just happened. I mean, we've seen the arch standing tall amongst the world's leaders and, and justice uh, makers at large and, and obviously you using his voice as a means of healing and, and also faith and unconditional love. I mean, to you, who was Desmond Tutu? What does his legacy reflect? Well, thank you very much, uh, Liesl, and good afternoon. Well, it's a sad day for South Africa and the world, I would argue, because um, we've lost a leader who um, has been standing firm against injustice. Uh, in Archbishop Desmond Tutu, we've lost someone who... Um, has been uh, the voice um, of reason, one who uh, didn't care who you were but uh, would speak truth to power. Uh, that didn't make him someone who was uh, generally liked uh, by those that he would then stand up against. Um, uh, so for me, the, the, the arch was someone that I, 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 I really loved, uh, someone that um, I respected uh, hugely. Um, I worked with him uh, uh, at the Human Rights, at the, uh, rather at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when I was seconded there uh, from about 2000 uh, to about 2002. Uh, and during this period, I interacted with him on an ongoing basis, on an off basis, rather, I should say. And I think it's important that as we remember him, we try then remember him as someone who uh, was for uh, social justice. So let's build a, a world that's more caring, caring of the poor especially, and not to neglect those who feel that the world has moved on and democracy continues to just leave them behind. Mm, absolutely. I mean, you've, you've spoken about how vocal he was on various issues, not only related to South Africa, perhaps further afield on our continent and, and even global issues as well. And, uh, you know, some, some arguably put him in a league of his own uh, during, during an era, you know, when we look at South Africa even to date, marked by political polarization. There's, there's lots of economic disparities, uh, corruption and greed. And perhaps even just this year, you know, his birthday tribute looked at truth to power and uh, how there's no future without justice. How, how can we begin to draw parallels from his life and times, perhaps for this dispensation and beyond? You know, one of the things that we should try our best to do is to um, revisit some of the things that he had um, recommended uh, through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, I, and if we were to do so, it did mean that we then have a, a sense of um, a country that will then try its best to, to rebuild. And uh, if we deal with our woundedness, uh, this was a person who dealt a lot with uh, woundedness, our woundedness as a, as, a, as a country. And if we are to deal with that woundedness, it includes um, uh, revisiting victims of uh, the apartheid government those that were declared as such, as victims. Uh, the second thing that we should do is to try and uh, deal with uh, uh, some of the thorny issues that uh, continue to bug us, uh, such as uh, race and identity. Uh, let's deal with issues that uh, uh, come up because of race and identity. Let's try our best to then uh, um, rebuild based on uh, what needs to be done in, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, space. And, and we will then succeed once we look back and we don't just um, uh, 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 almost uh, enjoy our freedom and just pat ourselves on the back for the freedom that we have that does not deliver when it comes to the poor. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of inequality, um, you know, unemployment and, and poverty at large, which are triple threats that continue to, to, to obviously exa be, become exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, when we look in a South African context, I mean, uh, just you representing the foundation as well. Um, obviously, he was a dear friend of uh, former President Nelson Mandela as well. I was reading, in fact, that the Arch, as he was affectionately known, phoned, um, you know, Mum Grassa Marshall to advise her that he believed um, the two of them, in fact, should get married, um, perhaps also looking at the message that this was sending to young people at large. So when we look at how vocal he was and all stances to date, I mean, how is the, the work done alongside him to date, um, you know, from the foundation on behalf of the family also reflected along these years? I haven't been able to speak to Mrs. Marshall, but I'll mm. be doing that um, uh, later today. And I can imagine that she must be uh, really shattered with the loss of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Mm. And, I, and I'm hoping that um, uh, I'll be able to speak to Mamle at some point at, uh, later today as well. Um, again, to say to her that um, uh, your loss is not just yours. Um, I, I, I remember the last time we were with them, uh, the two of them with the Arch, uh, just before lockdown um, in mm. February of last year. And how he then uh, uh, walked out uh, to go open the door for my wife um, to kind of convey a message that uh, be, being a gentleman uh, knows no age, uh, that all of us need to be those people that we must be gentle. In these days of gender-based violence, let's do everything possible to deal with it. And I think that's what, that those are messages that uh, I know Mrs. Michelle would want to also be conveying at a time like this. And I'm hoping that... Um, all of us uh, will then be rallying around uh, Mamlea and uh, saying to her that um, your pain is ours, uh, that uh, you can't lose a companion of so many years, um, a friend that you've uh, had for so many years, and it becomes uh, normal. And I'm hoping that uh, for those who are in power especially, remember his words every time. And by those in power, I just don't mean formal power, but everyone who exercises some power, you need to remember uh, the archer's words, that you are not doing it just for you. Remember that you're doing it for many who are trying to just survive every day. Uh, the pandemic has now uh, brought forward uh, the kind of difficulties that you have just said, Lisa, we have to deal with. And let's confront them together and try our best to make sure that um, uh, those who are just holding on to Russell, trying to survive, mm. that they at least make it. Well, Silo, before I let you go, my last question. I mean, when we look at um, his untimely passing, perhaps, and, and how he served as one of the last uh, elders of, of our nation at large, I, I wonder, in your opinion, you know, how do we, we begin to, um, you know, embody what he's also, um, you know, preached about in terms of unity, standing in solidarity, perhaps for this generation and beyond? You know, two things that I'd like to say um, in that regard. The first one is um, about how Arch believed in uh, the leadership of young people. I'm one of the Tutu Fellows, and uh, as a Tutu Fellow, I know that um, uh, the Arch would always just encourage us to take on the baton of leadership. But that we not, um, uh, we try and also make sure that we bring up young leaders uh, across. And I think if we are to succeed as a nation, we must continue to believe in young people and bring them up uh, so that they lead. Um, we, we should not just be believing that uh, only old people can do so. The second thing is um, if we are to do anything different, it's to ensure that we, we try to uh, pick up those who feel that democracy left them behind. And I think uh, the, 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 the sense of reconciliation uh, message that he had, nation building, um, was uh, part of the core uh, message that the arch always had, but also that you should also be defiant when um, others are trying to determine your agenda. Uh, you remember when uh, China was trying to determine that uh, uh, the Dalai Lama not come to South Africa, the arch defiantly uh, in invited him. And I think it's important that we remember those messages, that we shouldn't now become a new colony, uh, that uh, whose uh, the decisions are based on uh, what the international community did. Just like Madiba was defiant when it, when it came to those things, the arch was like that too. And I think we, we need to then be defiantly saying, uh, what is our national agenda? 
What is our national outlook when it comes to issues related to uh, our nation building agenda and reconciliation? But deal with our woundedness as well. Because some of that woundedness comes in the, the, the levels of high violence, uh, um, violent crime that we have, the high levels of um, gender based violence. Show how wounded we are. Mm. And let's try and deal with those wounds before it's too late. Silo, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, obviously, Silo Atang is the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, paying tribute to the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, again reflecting on his life and times, perhaps his influence that he's had in South Africa and the transition from apartheid into democratic South Africa, and perhaps how vocal he was uh, even into this dispensation, this democratic dispensation. Again, thank you, Silo, for your time uh, here on the SABC. Moving on to uh, Bantu Hola Misa, President of the United Democratic Movement, also on the line via Zoom, to uh, joining us to reflect on the life and, life and times. Mr. Hola Misa, very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Again, just as we heard from uh, Selo Atang from the Nelson Mandela Foundation, I mean, we've seen how the Arch, I mean, awarded a Nobel Peace Prize back in 1984 for his bravery, for eloquently speaking truth to power, uh, you know, against, uh, against the country's draconian racist policies, um, you know, that were put in place back in 1948. Not limited to that period, though, obviously also during this political dispensation. I mean, as a political leader to date, what has Desmond Tutu's legacy reflected for you as we're speaking and reflecting on his life and times? First and foremost, uh, allow me to pass uh, my condolences to Mama Leah, his child, uh, the children of uh, their children. Mm. Uh, we say in the to to Zelegani, to Twini, may his soul rest in peace. I remember as if it was only yesterday when uh, U Tutu was not well and he even threatened to say, I'm going to ask the doctors to. To, 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 to inject me to die. I flew to Cape Town uh, because the bishop and the family were panicking mm. as to say what is going to happen if uh, the bishop leave one day. General, can you give us advice? Uh, when I arrived at his house and then uh, he came through the passage Mama Leah was uh, sitting uh, in, uh, in her uh, chair. Uh, General, uh, I hear you guys, you uh, want to plan my last day, uh, but uh, you should start planning for, for my, my wife. He's more sick than me. So that was the bishop. But I'm happy that uh, that plan, which we we finalized within a week after that. We are following it uh, as it is when I saw the events this morning. And thanks to Bishop Mohoba for sticking to, to the program. We are looking forward to give uh, that to, to a farewell befitting his status. The legacy which he leaves behind is none other than to speak truth to the power. And he didn't mince his words in fighting for the rights of the citizens. Indeed, this champion uh, or uh, this servant of God has displayed an independent streak. And I hope that uh, the other leaders who tend to vacillate instead of taking decisions, we'll learn one or two things from him. Mr. Holomisa, as we look at the impact he's had in South Africa and the continent as well. I mean, we can also see that he's had a global legacy um, as well. We're looking at uh, how he was very outspoken about issues not only related to the continent, but uh, further field. I mean, even refusing to, to share stage with Tony Blair at one point, um, you know, just saying that, um, you know, leaders need to speak truth to power. What do you think his global legacy is going to also reflect beyond South Africa? 
Well, the truth of the matter is that uh, the people like Bishop Tutu uh, didn't want to wait for the armed wings of the liberation movements to go the full cycle of liberation. All right, uh, Bantola Misa, President of the United Democratic Movement, joining us via Zoom, reflecting on the life and times of the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. Again, uh, just speaking about his legacy to date, how he spoke truth to power, and uh, echoing some of his uh, fondest memories that he's had um, alongside, uh, you know, visiting him, uh, perhaps also. Um, after the Archbishop celebrated 90, his 90th birthday again, um, looking at the impact he's had not only on South Africa, but also the continent and the world at large. Perhaps we'll try to get him back on the line as he continues to pay his respects to, the, uh, to his family at large. Um, for now, though, let's uh, also take a look at uh, a tri other tributes coming in. Uh, obviously, at the hour, we've seen a PA PAC leader, Mzwanele um, Nyonso uh, also sharing his uh, thoughts around the uh, tributes and passing of the late Archbishop. Let's take a listen in. Let me take this opportunity on behalf of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania and convey our heartfelt condolences to the family of Archbishop Desmond Tutu who passed away today. Secondly, as Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, we will remember the bishop for declaring that the bishop, Dr. Stanley Mokhuba, would only occupy a prominent position in the new South Africa over his dead body, simply because he was once a political prisoner from the PAC. Secondly, we will remember the bishop for forgiving white people who never asked for forgiveness in this country. Thirdly, will remember him for forcing the African leaders to apologize for fighting against apartheid. May his soul rest in peace. Well, PSC leader Mzwan Nelen Nyonso again paying his respects to the late Archbishop De Emeritus Desmond Tutu. We'll take a quick ad break. We continue with more news around the passing of the late Archbishop on the other side. Uh, Professor Baron Yani, political analyst, joins us to reflect. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You are watching The Week Ahead with myself, Liesl Wilson. We continue to continue rather to pay respects to the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu here on the ACBC, reflecting on his life and times. Just earlier on, we spoke to the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Silo Hatang, and also uh, President of the United Democratic Movement, Mr. Bantuhola Misa. Again, they were paying their respects um, to the Archbishop. Welcoming Professor Barry Hanyani, political analyst and Northwest University lecturer to the conversation. Prof, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us also on sh such short notice. It's, it's quite a sad day for South Africa, perhaps the continent and the world at large. We, we've seen that uh, the arch, as he was affect affectionately known, you know, stood tall amongst the world leaders, peacemakers, uh, the healers, um, obviously issuing and standing for, for justice and unconditional love. What is his legacy going to reflect? Liesl, good afternoon. Good afternoon to your viewers and, of course, condolences to the family. Um, look, that's, that's a big question, really, to ask. Uh, if one looks at his career over time, both in, in, the, in the church as well as in politics, you are found wanting in terms of where do we start unraveling that legacy. But... But, but to make it much shorter and more direct, here is a person who stood for social justice, who, who stood for reconciliation at a time when it was, it was um, I'm tempted to use the phrase fashionable to do so, mm. but then he, he understood beyond that the importance of preserving humanity in all of its formats, and in particular, uh, becoming a critic of the current 
establishment in its various incarnation through, through the administrations we've heard since 1994. And becoming more vocal, at least in the last two administrations, in saying how, how can South Africa afford to drop the ball, especially uh, when the poor are still expecting more and would want to be catered for by, by this government and a government that needed not to be corrupt, a government that needed to respond to the plight of the, of the poor, as, as I said, and, and of course, a, a, a symbol of hope to those who uh, somewhat uh, experienced despair, uh, disgruntlement, and, and have lost all sense of, of, of hope for now and in the future. So it's unfortunate that on this hour, when we just thought that we are closing down the year 2021, mm. we found ourselves grieving. And, and one would then, of course, label this as, as a, a national loss, if not a global loss. Prof, um, thank you for those sentiments. And perhaps we can delve into some of the highlights, um, you know, that, that we've obviously been privy to, to witness over the, the lifetime that he's obviously um, continued to live out very boldly and vocally. One such uh, yes. sentiment that uh, he was known for was uh, after, you know, the African National, Democra African National Congress rather came into, into power, elected into the democratic dispensation in 94. I mean, we heard how the Anglican Archbishop in fact, continued to, um, you know, fearlessly speak um, to, to um, what's issues of moral rectitude. He, he never hesitated to, to call out the government, um, you know, especially if they were crossing ethical lines, perhaps failing yes. the poor, um, failing to address issues of poverty and un unemployment at large. So it seemed like he, he continued to stand at the forefront and, uh, you know, become vocal and remain vocal about those issues. How do we take on that baton that he's, uh, you know, handed over to us and continue to fight against those disparities? Lisa, let me, let me draw in as part of a response to that question, because I have a sense that it, it asks of us to reflect since 1994. But, but for me, it was his role in 1985, closest home, when, when, when we were at school in Soweto, uh, Skanundwana High School in Snawane, and there was a state of emergency. It was him and the late uh, Mama Winu who, after some of our students at Skanundwana were arrested, went to Moroka police station to have that group of students to be bailed out. Uh, you can imagine uh, students being held in prison uh, in various uh, places, but more so in Morocco, uh, for violating an, an inhumane prescription and a rule uh, imposed under the disguise of a state of emergency. But fast forward to that, it, it was his, his role in the East Rand when uh, our, the very own people that, that he stood for in the African National Congress, as young as they were, were and some in courses, uh, and, and some of the organizations then, uh, mad at uh, uh, Madame uh, uh, Maki, who they accused of being the spy to the establishment. And he was there to stop that. And unfortunately, uh, it didn't work out. But that, for me, were the two incidences prior to 94. But then your question says, post-94, mm. uh, was this the, the moral voice? But, but, but it's, it's that history of struggle. It's that history of of seeking social justice that I suspect carried him through to say liberation was, was fought hardly uh, and, and, and in a way uh, blood was, was spilled. And how did we come to a point where the ball was dropped at a time when, as I said earlier, the hope of and the plight of the poor was at the center of a response that needed to be part of the architect of, of the post-apartheid dispensation. And so he spoke strongly about that. If you remember that press conference where he, he warned the ANC to say, uh, don't forget that you were part of a liberation struggle. You were part of 
uh, you did not necessarily deliver liberation on the table, but you were part of, and today you are in government, and seemingly you are there for your own interests and not necessarily taking care of the public will. And, 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 and that for me will resonate for quite some time, so long as, 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 as I live and, and I engaged with the politics of the country. Mm. He, he became that moral center in a sense. And, and it's just unfortunate that uh, some of his words to date have not actually resonated well in terms of calling for good governance and in terms of calling for those who are found to be on the wrong side of the law to be sanctioned and face punishment as per the laws of the country. Prof, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. And when we look at his legacy, I mean, we can't limit it to South Africa alone or even the continent. I mean, he became a global voice, a global moral yes. voice, um, as, as, you've, as yes. you've alluded to. I mean, he spoke out on, on other matters as well, described as a genuine person of character, um, obviously also really seeking uh, peace. I mean, there's, there's him being vocal about issues in, in, in Libya, um, there's yeah. him being yeah. vocal on um, issues in Myanmar, um, the United States. Um, again, also reading about uh, how he, in September of 2012, refused to stand on the same stage as Tony Blair. Um, you know, just uh, really taking a stance to say, if leaders are going to lie, then who, who is then uh, actually going to be uh, talk, talking the truth? I mean, that uh, also solidifies his role in the global sphere. What do you think his global legacy also reflects? Yeah, firstly, as, as an anti-apartheid activist, although being, being the man of the cloth, uh, serving the clergy quite well until his retirement, but he spoke strongly against injustice all over the world. Mm. Uh, let's not forget the, the, the American uh, realities in this instance. Of course, being closer to, to people like Jesse Jackson and others, and receiving his treatment for, for his prostate cancer in that part of the world. So, so that, that, in a sense, always would bring him into the stage in terms of reflecting on, on, on issues of, of liberation in the U.S. Uh, and, and, of course, the affinity between us and the African-Americans in terms of our common purpose, in terms of our common struggles, would always bring him to the fore uh, to say, has, has, has social justice globally been achieved, and especially for the African child? So, so that, for me, uh, remains one of the most notable contributions that he has forever uh, uh, contributed immensely. Then, of course, there was the Palestinian question, mm. that it, it, there was always that need to be rational about it, and then, of course, to call out atrocities on both fronts, uh, to, to actually uh, be seized, and, 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 but more so uh, towards uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, issues and struggles. And, and I think his, his contribution there would be to say, uh, are we not reinventing another apartheid on a global scale and more so at the disadvantage of the Palestinians? So, so, so that, that for me will also stand out. But let's not forget the politics of the United Nations. Uh, that was brought to, to bear, and all thanks to his politics and his activism in making us aware that the world is not an even playing field. The world is riddled with so much in terms of injustices. Mm. Prof, let me um, conclude this conversation just also looking at another issue that he was very conscientious of, and that was the uh, plight of the youth, future generations, and also education at large. And when we look at his iconic journey, perhaps uh, when he was, you know, in the 50s, a teacher having resigned from, from missionary school, perhaps to, to join the struggle um, and obviously stand firm in the fight against um, the Bantu Education Act um, and other oppressive, racist um, you know, legislation. I, I wonder, you know, what parallels could be drawn from his stances back then, um, particularly as we, as we, you know, look at the system to date mm -hmm. and how we could better empower and equip the future generations to come. Mm -hmm. Liesl, uh, hence my reference earlier on to the 1985 experience. Mm. Uh, luckily, I, I wasn't part of the core that was arrested 
and 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 detained at Moraga Police Station. But some of my my peers were there, mm. and it was him once again with the late uh, Winnie Mandela who went to that police station to say, "These are kids. These are these are are, are, are school peoples. You you don't just uh, incarcerate them because of the 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 system that is unjust." Um, surely you could you could sense that his passion for education has always been uh, in his in his in his. Uh, veins in his politics, if you want, and and he would do everything to put uh, on on the front foot the interests of students and, of course, uh, on a broader scale, the interest of our education system. Uh, perhaps one would then have to go back to the archives to see his response to issues of the curriculum statement, the change in our education system, and then, of course, the plight of of the schools in poor and rural areas. Let's not forget that infrastructure there, the, the, the issue of Hitler trains, uh, and of course, uh, victimization of some of, of, of the children there may have well occupied his consciousness to say, is this the new government that we voted for, that we've established, that should have in the first place prevented this and make sure that uh, the African child does receive the best education available in a country where resources are available as much as there could be claims of limited resources. Mm. Prof Barry Anyani, thank you very much for uh, reflecting on the life and times. Again, political analyst and Northwest University lecturer, Professor Barry Hanyane, um, chatting to us about the Anglican Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, his legacy for the country and the, and the world at large. Uh, in fact, uh, looking at some of the, the stances he's taken, um, a mor becoming a moral voice for the world in terms of social injustice and the plight of the poor. In fact, uh, on your screens right now, these are live visuals coming through from Vilgazi Street in Soweto. Um, this is the uh, Tutu House. Uh, it's in fact a historical heritage site. Um, as we know, that street is uh, the, the, the street, in the, the only street in the world rather, to have two Nobel laureates um, to have lived um, on that same street again, um, the Anglican Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu receiving that Nobel Peace Prize back in 1984, um, obviously for his struggles, his fight against the apartheid, and uh, perhaps also leading the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for President Nelson Mandela, again remaining vocal on uh, issues that continue to affect majority of South Africans, including you know triple threats of poverty, unemployment, and inequality at large. Again, uh, as uh, we say set up there and perhaps um you know, get uh, more information regarding activity outside the area. We'll continue to bring you more updates on that front. All right, I'd like to welcome Mr. Banto Olamisa, President of the United Democratic Movement, back into the conversation. Mr. Olamisa, I do apologize for earlier. It seems we did, we did lose you there. You, you were speaking about uh, the life and, and times, reflecting on his legacy, and uh, you fondly shared you know, one of your last memories that uh, you had uh, with the, the Anglican Archbishop. Um, I think just to rehash... Um, what that perhaps looked um, like for you at large and what his legacy meant for you. Could you perhaps reiterate that for us? Well, I was saying uh, the last time I met him was uh, when he was not well. I mm. think three years ago, it was the 1st of January, then I flew down to see him in Cape Town. And uh, fast forward, he was already covered that but his legacy, one, people will remember him for having a fought for justice, irrespective whether this is an apartheid government or a democratic government. Secondly, that uh, Bishop Tutu uh, was a beacon of hope for many in this country. He was a torchbearer of our moral compass. One sometimes asks some questions as to where are the tutus of today? Mm. What happened to the civil society which was dynamic, which brought the apartheid to her knees, to his knees? Apartheid was not brought down by guns. 
or this having liberated so uh, militarily speaking. It was led by the clergy people like Tutu and uh, many others and the international community which he organized also contributed to our freedom. Not to mention the UDF element, which were working very hard inside the country. Now you ask yourself, where are those structures? But one is not surprised because it would appear others were integrated into various posh positions, either as DGs or ministers, others as ambassadors. So, but we need to come up with a solution. This tripartite alliance, as we know it, it mm -hmm. has failed South Africa, and Bishop Tutu has said so on many occasions. We need to discuss the establishment of a new alliance, which will take us back to the original agenda, which was abandoned uh, and replaced by looters who looted our resources. So these are the issues Bishop Tutu didn't mince his words. And he even said to the president, I will pray for your organization to go down. It looks like she was prophetic. Mr. Olamisa, you've described him as a beacon of hope and a torchbearer. And, um, you know, others have also echoed that he served as a moral voice, not only for South Africa, but the world at large. Um, again, as you've spoken, um, as we've seen rather, you know, he was very vocal um, during the, uh, after the elections back in 1994, you know, continuously um, speaking truth to power when it came to, um, you know, the fight and the plight of the poor and uh, social justice at, at large. And I, and I wonder, as you, as you ask these questions, you know, where are the tutors of this uh, generation, of this dispensation, perhaps also drawing parallels from his life and his times, what can we begin to do to carry on the baton that uh, he's handed over to us in his 90 years of existence? I think uh, without knowing what is going to come out of the Zondo Commission, mm. we should uh, hopefully that there will be some findings which will show us some direction of getting out of the quagmire we are in. I'm sure some of the issues which Judge Zondo will be highlighting would be the issues which made Bishop Tutu to be concerned. That here are the people who paraded, who masqueraded and paraded as struggle stalwarts. Little did we know that uh, these are hyenas of the highest order because they robbed the very poor. So I hope the Zondo Commission uh, findings will reinforce and also guide uh, reinforce rather the concerns of people like Bishop Tutuman and many others in this country. And then we start drawing a line to say, you dare to cross this line again, irrespective whether you are ANC, DA or UTM or whatever. But we start another route to rescue the image of the country. Mr. Holamisa, I want to thank you very much for your time again. Bantu Holamisa, President of the United Democratic Movement, joining us via Zoom to pay his respects to the late Anglican Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. Again, uh, obviously hearing from various people in all sectors of society, all parts of society, you know, reflecting on his life and times, the impact that he's had. Again, strong sentiments about how he's become a beacon of hope, a moral voice and a centre for, um, you know, the plight against uh, the poor and uh, social injustices at large. Again, also what uh, the state of the country looks like, the world looks like, and perhaps what future leadership, um, you know, w will look like as that baton is now handed over after, uh, you know, him having celebrated his 90, 90 years um, in existence uh, in October. Again, uh, we'll continue to bring you more updates, more interviews with various people around the world as we reflect on his life and time. Now, Executive Director of Amnesty International South Africa, Shanila Mohammed, also sent in her tributes. Let's take a listen into what she had to say. 
Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu was a beacon of light for the human rights movement, not only in South Africa, but globally. His unwavering commitment to equality and rights for all was a much needed moral compass during the turbulent apartheid era. And even after South Africa gained its independence in 1994, the Archbishop continued to raise his voice against oppression, against violation of human rights, whether it be gender-based violence or LGBTI rights or whether it be rights that were violated by the state or by anybody else. The Archbishop was never, never afraid to speak truth to power. The Archbishop was never afraid to call out those that violated rights, no matter who they were and no matter where they were in the world. And we need to uphold the legacy of this truly remarkable human rights warrior by ensuring that we continue with the fights that he was so passionate about that we continue to fight for equality, we continue to fight for human rights for all, we continue to fight against gender-based violence, we continue to fight against the violation of the rights of the LGBTI community. That is the one way that we can honour the, the lifelong commitment that the Archbishop has made, not only to this country, but, but globally. As Amnesty International, we send our deepest condolences to Mama Leah Tutu, his children and his family. As tributes continue to pour in for the late Anglican Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, obviously we've been, uh, you know, receiving feedback and uh, people have been echoing their sentiments on our various social media platforms as well. Let's take a look at some of these tweets that have been coming through at this hour. Well, firstly, from President Saul Ramaphosa, the passing of Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu is another chapter of bereavement in our nation's farewell to a generation of outstanding South Africans who have bequeathed us a liberated South Africa. Another tweet at the South, the U.S. Embassy in South Africa is saying on behalf of the U.S. mission to South Africa, we extend our deepest condolences to Mrs. Nomalizo Liatutu and the family of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and his passing. We join South Africa and the global community in honoring a man who spent his life fearlessly speaking truth to power. Bobby Wine, the news of the passing of Archbishop Desmond Tutu is very sad. A giant has fallen. We thank God for his life, a purposeful life truly lived in the service of humanity. May his soul rest in peace and condolences to all people world over who were touched by his life and ministry. Sir Richard Branson also tweeting, I'm so sad that Archbishop Tutu has passed away. The world has lost a giant. He was a brave leader, a mischievous delight, a profound thinker and a dear friend. All those were just some of the tweets coming through at the hour again, um, you know, world leaders and citizens, global citizens, reflecting on the life and times of the late uh, Anglican Archbishop. Again, his legacy to date, um, many saying he served as a beacon of hope and a moral voice for South Africa and the world over, very vocal on issues uh, regarding inequality and poverty. And uh, again, holding truth to power, as was also mentioned by a few of our guests that we have interviewed. In fact, uh, him having played a very big role across the continent as well as we've seen. I'd like to invite Professor Mamo Muchi, South African Research Chair for Innovation Studies at TUT, to also uh, reflect on the life and times, perhaps joining the conversation. Prof Mamo, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I express my sincere condolences also to our uh, uh, really strong uh, human rights uh, struggle uh, fighter all his life, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, you know, he was a great, I mean, we have, a, in South Africa, we have some very important great people that have struggled all their lives. Uh, Madiba did, mm. and, uh, and he also, uh, he got his military training in the country where I was born, Ethiopia. Um, and the struggle, I mean, we were all together. And when I was a, a young boy, I always heard about South Africa in the news all the time. So South Africa has been implanted in my heart. So when I want to leave Europe, I said I only want to go to South Africa. <laughs> wow. I, I came to South Africa, that's what happened. But I think I, it is to do with our great uh, heroes, like... Um, 
Madiba, Desmond Tutu, all of, all of all the struggle that you know the uh, Robert Sabuque, all of them yes. are, are in our heart. And they, you are part of us. You are part of we are you and you are us, all of us together. Speaking, speaking of which, I mean, Prof, you're obviously speaking about unity and, and standing in solidarity, which uh, when we look at this period we're also in, um, you know, the, the celebrations of Kwanzaa also come to mind. But when we look at the life and times of the late uh, Anglican Archbishop as well, I mean, that was uh, and something that he, uh, you know, unashamedly stood for, perhaps uh, advocating on behalf of, uh, you know, all Africans and all um, those around the world, highlighting the plight of the poor and inequality at large. I, I wonder what his legacy is going to look like um, for those on the continent, especially, you know, him being vocal about issues on Liberia, issues um, in Zimbabwe, amongst others, you know, apart from South Africa. Yes, I mean, he did everything, including Palestine, many, even internationally he did. Uh, uh, he, was, he was standing genuinely for human rights and for justice. And, and, and he used moral, spiritual intelligence with, to, to actually redefine politics. You know, the politics we have in Africa or uh, in the whole world now is dirty, too dirty. He wants to clean it up. He had actually remind us, he says, the, the, the past cannot be changed. Opinions don't define our reality. Everyone's journey Although it's different, we must know how to unite. Things always get better with time. We should make things to get better with time. Judgments, uh, we should be careful uh, because they are a confession of character. So don't make judgments that are poor. O overthinking will lead us to sadness. So don't also, you know, just get confused. Mm. Uh, happiness is inside us. We should. We should also start if we have happiness inside we can also send it outside positive thoughts create positive developments and i think that's what he says kindness we should be all always having don't only when you fail you quit don't quit don't fail mm. uh, and so i think what goes around comes around so he had some extraordinary ideas uh, values that that are that direct him and trying to, he also wanted to use this to uh, uh, motivate and uh, everyone but of course our world is complicated as you see so we still have challenges in africa we we have conflicts we yes. have more conflicts than reconciliation still we have fighting going on we have coup d'etats we have you know look what's happening now in uh, sudan look what's happening in ethiopia everywhere now mm. Wars are happening now. Should they be happening now like this? Is it right? No. And I think, why didn't they listen to an advice uh, like our uh, Desmond Tutu and uh, all these things they struggled in their entire life? They haven't heard it. They, they don't hear us. That's the problem. I think that's a big challenge we have. We still have a big challenge in Africa. We are disunited. We're not united. Well, absolutely. And, and uh, you speak about, um, you know, some of the other issues on the continent as well. You've spoken about Daf uh, Darfur and Sudan. Um, we've also seen the Ethiopia Tigray conflict. Um, I mean, back in 2007, when, when uh, the Anglican Archbishop, in fact, joined the, the group of elders, um, you know, and visited um, Sudan and South Sudan, trying to bridge an understanding um, and, and, and also, um, you know, just... Um, halt on the violence that was happening in that region. And then again, as we move to the uh, current Ethiopia Tigray crisis that's also happening, the cultural um, and the heritage um, you know, crisis that we're also seeing in, that, in, in, in some of the aspects uh, related to the conflict, the economic disparities as well. I mean, what legacy do you think, uh, or drawing from his legacy rather, what parallels can we begin to implement um, you know, as we look at these different issues in 2021, perhaps as we as we go into this new year? Yeah, no, good question. Um, I think from South Africa, to be honest with you, um, there's a lot of lesson a number of other African countries can draw. You had the biggest challenge, you had apartheid. But from apartheid, you didn't want to go to uh, a war. You said, let's stop the war. 
and then he created reconciliation. Not only did you do that, you changed the constitution. You made a very, I mean, I don't know if you've read the constitution. It's a very good constitution. Mm -hmm. Now you created the political Kodesa. The only weakness you have is that you did not create the economic Kodesa. The reconciliation on that side also. In other words, the collaboration about how to all the communities to come. Now, what, what we can say from uh, the leadership side, from Desmond Tutu, from all, all Mandela, all of, all, all, all of you side, uh, Thabombeke, all of you, I mean, you, you, are, you have all tried uh, in different ways, you have contributed. You have done something that is not just good for South Africa, for the whole of Africa. The reason is Africa is conflict ridden All the borders are uh, cynical. They are not right borders. We have serious challenges in Africa. So there will always be conflicts, like we had in the Darfur area, as you rightly mentioned. It. There's a lot of conflict. There are people, uh, different uh, ethnic groups that live differently, and they don't value each other. They don't work with each other. So they started fighting, trying to take what others have. And so what happens, they continue to war. For example, if you take even Sudan and Ethiopia, in the borders, uh, there's a border uh, conflict all the time. They say, the Sudanese say, this part belongs to us, which is in Ethiopia, and the other side. So you always have conflicts like that. In all of Africa, we have. So the best thing we should do mm. is learn from the experience, that, from the, the good things that have been done, like the reconciliation idea that came, the general idea from South Africa, and all also the great values that these that this leaders like uh, Desmond Tutu and others have expressed. We should really now continue it. We should have, in fact, what we should have is even a university for uh, reconciliation, conflict resolution. Yes. We should have something like that where we could call it a Desmond Tutu uh, uh, reconciliation university, conflict resolution university or something like that. We should develop it like this and try to support Africa as a whole. I think that's my suggestion. And this Kwanzaa also that he just asked me, um, it started with a university professor, yeah? Uh, you know, that, uh, yes. that uh, you know, uh, Karenga, Ma, Ma, Maunea Karanga is the one that started it in 1966. It's basically a, an American, African culture uh, for Ameri African Americans. That's how it started. And the main values are quite critically important. They are unity, self-development, collective work and responsibility, Thank you so much, Prof. We're going to have to leave the conversation there. Again, Professor Mamo Muchi, um, you know, just uh, joining us to chat about the life and times reflect on, on the legacy that uh, the late Anglican Archbishop has had on the continent and the world at large. Again, described as diminutive in height, but a skyscraper of moral conscience. The Arch stands tall among the world's justice seekers and peacemakers. That's where we're going to leave it for you today. From myself, Diesel Wilson, and the rest of the team until next time it is goodbye may his soul rest in peace